All right, good evening, everybody. Um, so it seems kind of superfluous to let you know that my name's Jason. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, um, I work here at New Relic. And so I'm here to talk to you tonight about um, some issues of testing and some things about what I call testing the multiverse. Um, so a large part of the time that I spent here at New Relic, um, I worked on uh, the Ruby agent. So that's the gem that you install into your application. And there's some really interesting things that come out of testing a piece of code that's going to go into a lot of different environments and different versions and different um, compatibility settings for things in your apps. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about here tonight. Um, you know, there was a suggestion that maybe there's an alternative talk that I should have given, um, but I didn't really have time to prepare for that. This is the beard picture that uh, Jonan was referring to. So. Yeah, I know. It was long and kind of nested. So anyways, <laughs> the testing talk's going to be way better, though. So if you've been in Ruby for a couple of years now, or, or even if you're new, there is probably a framework that you have heard about. It's a framework that almost all of us have had some exposure to. A lot of us are working in it. It's something that's drawn us into Ruby and something that's kind of made the scene explode for this particular language. And that, of course, is Ruby on Bails. So Bales is a framework that was created to allow you to very easily create command line applications, convention-based command line applications that are so simple for you to write. Um, most of you here probably remember the Unicorn Puma Wars of 2018 and how there was kind of this schism in the web space in Ruby. Well, this really made, uh, it made space for command line applications to have a renaissance. It, it gave space for this to happen, which is just excellent. Um, so this is kind of the canonical example of a Bales application. So this is a tweet command. You give it a run method, and it can take parameters, and it does whatever sort of action you're interested in. When you run this at your command line, it looks like this. So you say Bales, you give it the command, the other arguments. That probably should have been hashtag cool. I'm, I'm not a social media guy, sorry. Um, but you know, this is, this is something that we're all familiar with. And this is an amazing leap forward for developers in Ruby to be able to build these applications so, so quickly. Well, you know, any time that this sort of sea change happens in a tech ecosystem, it brings an opportunity for other new ideas to come to light. And so one of them, that I came up with in, in thinking about this productivity gain was the PR metric. Now, who, who here is familiar with this particular measurement? Anybody? Good, because I made it up. So it would be really weird <laughs> if you actually knew what this was. So it stands for programmer input output ratio. So it's a measurement of the length of the commands that you put in over the length of the output that you get. So it's sort of like it's measuring the leverage of the commands that you're executing. It's giving you, you know, this, this sort of way of telling just how much power you've got in those commands. This is way better than measuring programmer productivity by lines of code, people. I mean, this is, this is the wave of the future for measuring how programmers are working. So I put in an issue on the Bales project and asked, hey, can we, you know, get some instrumentation in there? Let's start measuring this. I want to know when I'm issuing my Bales commands, like how, how am I doing on this? How is this helping me out? And you know, open source being what it is, you can see they closed it. They said, yeah, you know, this is kind of a little tangential to what we really actually do. But hey, you could go write something yourself. And so I did. So I wrote a project called Straw. So Straw is an instrumentation library that hooks into your Bales application and measures the links of these things and draws this data out. Here's kind of a little uh, output of what the data looks like. It tells you the length of the output. I don't grab the whole output because, you know, that could get really long. It tells you the status code, whether it was an OK command or not. You know, you might want to measure how often you're causing errors when you're running your commands and gives you the parameters. So with this information, we can do all sorts of analytics and some really cool stuff. But you're probably wondering at this point why I'm talking about all of this stuff. And what does this have to do with testing? Well, testing is where this story got really interesting. Because testing 
straw, independent of bales, was not really going to prove that anything was working. You know, I could write a little unit test and mock something out, but that doesn't show that this was really doing what I needed it to do. So there was some amount of the testing that I needed to do as a good programmer, as a good Rubyist, that had to interact directly with bales, the framework that I was building this on top of. So here's an example of one of the first tests that I wrote. It instantiates the Bales runner, which is kind of the core abstraction for running my commands. And then I have some helpers. This assert row checks that my um, straw output, the data that I gather, looks like what I was expecting it to be. So wrote some tests, shipped to the gym, people all over are able to get a measure of their productivity. Everything is good. Well, life doesn't stay still in open source. And Bales released a 2.0 version. You know, as they do, they come out with some new features. Fortunately for me, this didn't really change anything about how Straw needed to work, but it introduced this puzzle for me of, well, how do I test against both of the versions? Right? I've written this set of unit tests. I normally just say rake test, but that runs against one of these versions and not both. So how do we solve that? How do we go about testing in a world where we have multiple versions of our code that we want to check with different sets of dependencies? Thankfully, Ruby provides a lot of the tools that are necessary to build a testing infrastructure around this sort of idea, and Bundler is a key part of that. So just about everyone here has probably, if you've written a Ruby application, you've made a gem file. And you put a you put it in your directory, you put it there, and you run Bundler with your commands, and it takes care of everything for you. Well, something you might not be aware of is that you don't actually have to name the file gem file, and you can override where Bundler will look up what gem file it should use when executing a command. So we're going to use that to our advantage. In the straw project, uh, in my test directory, I generated a couple of different gem files. So a gem file that has my Bales 1.0 dependencies and a gem file that has my Bales 2.0. And this sets out sort of the two sets of gems that I would want to be testing against. These gem files look just like a perfectly normal gem file. There's nothing unusual about it. it spells out, locks down the versions. If there were other dependencies that I had, I would include those as well. You know, anything that you can do with Bundler, you can fill in here. Now, if I want to run my tests with one particular version or the other, what I have to do is I have to tell Bundler to run my tests using that particular specialized gem file. This is available through an environment variable called bundle gem file. I'm doing it on two lines here and exporting that environment variable just for readability on the screen. You can do it in line on the command as well. And then once I've set that in the environment, I can just bundle exec my tests like I normally would, and it will pull in and run my test suite in the presence of those gems that I had selected for a particular version. Looks like this. Everything runs. Everybody's happy. So this kind of introduces a little bit of interesting um, obscurity, though, because, well, now it's kind of hard to tell, and as my output gets longer and longer, like what version of things am I actually running against anymore? You know, I used to be in a world where there was one set of dependencies that I was dealing with. Now I might have either of these versions or maybe multiple point versions or different sets of things. So to help myself out in my test helper, originally I added this little line there. So it said running bales and peels out the bales version and spits that out for us. So we get a little bit of output, a little bit of a hint of which of these test suites is this doing. So if I write a big long script, which we'll see later, that's able to run all of the tests, I can tell which of those failures that might come through, where they actually came from. Now, this was a nice start. You can actually do one better, though, because Bundler provides you with a list of the gems that it has loaded and the things that it has available. And we can format those out in this fashion. We go through that list of specs get the name and the versions, join them together. And now what we get is a full set of dependencies that we can see in the output when we're running a test. Now, you don't see it here because the dependencies are pretty shallow. But this will tell you all of the gems that have been loaded. And so potentially, as things get more complicated, as Bales gets more machinery and sub-gems and other things get into the mix, it can be very useful to know exactly which point version of a gem is being run 
because incompatibilities can creep into odd spaces where you might not expect. All right. So that's all well and good, but I don't know about you. I don't like typing lots of environment variables and big long command lines to run things. So we're going to bundle this up and we're going to put it in a rake task. And I'm going to call it rake multiverse because this is a multiverse of different gem combinations, different possibilities of where we're going to run. So this task starts out and looks pretty simple. I've got a little bit of a, a little bit of help here to make it easier to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I rely on Rake's file list, and here, by default, if you don't pass anything in, it's going to look for any of the gem files that are in my test directory, and it will find all of those. Then we iterate through each of those, and as we run each of them, it will do that same thing that I was doing, where it sets the environment variable and goes and runs the tests in that context. So when I say rake multiverse, my test suite runs for all the possible combinations that I have, one after the other. And that lets me you know, get a sense of how my gym's doing overall. Now, occasionally, this isn't exactly what I want. And so I've also provided a way that you can pass in the suffix of the gem file. So you can see it says bales 1.0 there. And if you do that, it hits this line instead and makes a more uh, targeted selection of the gem file that I want to run. So if I know that there's a particular problem with one of the dependencies, I can just run that set of tests and keep my focus and keep things moving more quickly. So, you know, we all like to think that we could write code without bugs, but reality intrudes. Apparently, um, some Tim guy um, downloaded the repo and then tried to run the stuff and it failed because he didn't have the gems installed. I appreciate the plus one, Jonah. That was, thank you. Adding value. Yes, adding value to open source through plus ones. So, I mean, the issue here as you look at the stack trace and, and read the messages is fairly clear. You know, he tried to run the test suite and he didn't have this gems installed that he needed to for one of those sets because all we're doing is bundle execing to run that. We're never actually doing any installation. So this is fairly easy to work around for us. You might think, well, it works on my machine, but you know, you got to deal with it for other people. So there's an easy acronym to remember for the solution here. Always bundle constantly. This is the life of a Ruby developer already, but it, it points in the direction we're headed. So instead of doing just our normal bundle exec, now we're just going to hit it with the big hammer and we're going to say we're going to bundle install for the particular environment before we execute those tests. Now this is heavier than I wish it was, but it takes care of it. You're going to end up with the right dependencies. Somebody can clone this clean and do it, and they're going to get a good run that's going to install the things that they need. You'll notice also that I'm pulling out the bundle gem file and setting that in the environment separately here where I had been setting it on the command. That's because things are going to get a little more complicated. But that line where I set it in the environment, everything that follows that, any of the back ticks where I run other commands, are going to pick up that environment variable and run with that gem uh, file set that we're looking for. All right. But like I alluded to, bundling every single time that we run the test is kind of onerous. It's sort of, it's slower than I wish it was. I mean, this isn't really an indictment of Bundler. It does a good job of doing what it needs to do, but you know, we're introducing a bunch of extra um, checking and potentially network calls every single time we run our tests. So what can we do to get around that? Luckily, Bundler provides us with uh, some tools for it. There is a minus minus local option that Bundler exposes. And when you run this, it will minimize, it doesn't completely eliminate, but it will minimize the number of network calls that it makes. And it will try to resolve things using the gems that it already has installed. So this is going to make a best faith effort. If you've already done all the downloads, you've already installed all the gems, this is going to work. It's going to return, and everything's going to be happy. Well, if you don't have the gems that you need, we've told it, hey, you are not allowed to go download things. And so that command is going to fail. And that's what the next line's about. So the obscurely named dollar question mark is the status of the last process, the last child process that we ran here. So this is telling us what's the status of the bundle install minus minus local 
that we just ran. And if that is not a success, we'll turn around and we'll just run the full installation the, the, the way that we did before. You know, if you've got to install the gems, you've got to pay for it. But we can try to keep it so that you don't do that unless you absolutely need it. And then once that's all finished, we are in a good state and we're able to go run our tests the way we started. OK, so use the appraisal gem. You might be doing it wrong. Well, almost certainly. Um, so this is actually one of the spots where we step out of my little fantasy story about bales and, and my library and look at something that is actually real. So this gem file switching that we've been discussing is actually bundled up in a gem called appraisals. Um, this is available, I think, I forget who made this, and I feel bad that I don't remember, but this is a fairly well-established gem in the Ruby space. Hmm? Thoughtbot. Thoughtbot, yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, so what it allows you to do is you can set up an appraisal file and this is um, similar to what we were doing with making individual separate gem files. Um, the difference here is that what you do is you create each of these little blocks. So you say appraise, give it a name, and then a block. And that block is treated as a delta on top of the gem file that you ship with your gem yourself. So you'll notice that there's a lot less boilerplate here. I don't have rake and many tests and all the other things that I bring with my gem. It only has the difference that I want to pivot on in my testing. Once you've done that, you say appraisal install, and it generates something that looks very similar to what we already created, a set of gem files and gem file locks that are based off of those versions that we fed into it. Appraisals then has its own command that you run. You provide it with the name of the particular appraisal set. And one of the nice keys about this tool is that it allows you to run any Ruby command after it, not just the rake test that we were baking into our particular rake file. And so if you had some other Ruby script that you wanted to run with a particular dependency, you could do that as well. And appraisals is there to let you run it with that alternate gem set. So if this is as far as you need to take things, appraisals is a really good gem uh, for doing this sort of multi-version testing. But there's some differences, there's some stuff down the road that I want to carry on with our testing framework. I want to keep looking at how Straw built things uh, itself and see where that leads us. So, looks like Tim's back. Repo steps use 08. Really? I mean, that's like a pre release, like version 2 is out. Why, why is he using such an old version? Well, OK, so reality is people don't upgrade their versions of stuff out there all the time. Not everybody can be right on the bleeding edge. And so when you're authoring a gem that builds on top of other things, you got to make decisions about what you're going to support and what you're not and have a clear policy on that. And ideally, what you want is you want to be able to test that. So let's talk about what we do here in the case of something that is below the supported version that I actually want to care about. First thing, we want to examine how this failure is actually happening and what it looks like and how it's going to impact our code. So we're going to set up another gem file. We're going to set it up for the 08 version. We're going to go run that and confirm that we see the same sort of failure uh, that Tim reported on that issue. So undefined method run for Bales runner. Now, at this point, we got to go look at the the history of things, you know, go look at the bail source, see what happened between 0, 08 and 1. And sure enough, we find a commit where there was a method that used to be named execute, and now is named run. And that happens to be one of the key points that Straw interacted with. So this was, you know, something that changed the compatibility of our gem with the thing that it was building on top of. So we're left with a little bit of a decision. We can work around this. We can write code that supports this. But you know what? I'm not that interested in dealing with pre-1.0 software here. So what I want to do is I want to make my gym be safe so it doesn't do anything bad. It won't crash. But it will just throw up its hands and not operate if it lands in this environment where it can't really work with the code as written. So let's figure out how to do that. Thankfully, 
Uh, Ruby gives us most of the tools that we need, and the Bales developers did me a favor in making a version constant that I can check. And so what we're going to do is we'll build out a method that defines our criteria for what a supported version of Bales is. Now, I'll make the brief call out that some of you in the room might be cringing at the greater than or equal to on the string. That is not the correct way to compare version numbers. I know that it's a lot shorter, so just imagine that that's the full um, good way of looking at those numbers. Um, and if you don't know how to do it correctly, go look it up. There's some good options available. And on that note, I want to make a call out to some other gems. Um, I'm not going to name any particular names, but if you maintain a gem and the only place that your version shows up is in the gem spec as a hard-coded string that you're assigning there, you're making life hard for people that might want to build on top of you. May not be your, uh, your highest priority, but I, as an uh, engineer who's had to build instrumentation on top of other libraries, when you don't give me a version that I can check, I've got to do other kind of crazy things to figure out what version of your software I'm running. And you don't really want that. So. Put your version numbers in a constant. If you make a new gem today with Bundler, it will do that for you automatically. So don't undo what it does for you there. And everybody will be happier. All right, so back to our story. We had seen how we would uh, write a method that checks for us whether we are in a supported Bales version or not. And the simplest possible thing that we can do with this to get our tests running again is simply wrap the tests that we have executed in this check. You know, Ruby, when it executes a file, there's no difference between when it's requiring the file and running through it line by line as it goes through it to interpret it initially, and when it's running code that's inside of your classes and methods. So there's nothing that makes it so we can't just put our if out here, gate off the tests that are no longer appropriate. So when we're in 08, this test does not work because we do not actually instrument anything to be able to do it. But that's not quite enough for me. Like That just makes it so that my tests don't fail if I run it there. What I really want to check is I want to check that I, as the developer of Straw, have not done something bad to somebody's application if they are running on this old version. And so here's one example of a way that we can test that. So Straw has a writer. This is the object that all the data goes and gets piped out to. And so in this test, what I'm doing is I'm just replacing it with a bare object doesn't support any of the things that are necessary. So if any part of straw runs and tries to write to it, that thing's just going to fall over and raise, and this test is going to fail. Once I've done that, so I've kind of put that monkey wrench in there, I go and run a bails command. And if that passes and everything goes through fine, then I can be fairly confident that my code has not instrumented anything. Straw has not gotten its hooks in there and gotten into the pipeline of the things that are going to run. So this is one way that you can think about checking that your code that you're building on top of something else doesn't interfere when it's in a bad situation where it can't do the things that it needs to. You can be a little more direct about it, though, too. So Straw works on some monkey patching to be able to get itself into Bales. You know, there are nicer patterns that we wish that were there, but you know, sometimes monkey patching is a part of reality for us. And we know that all of the things that we inject into those classes include the word straw. So it's not a bad idea to write a test that just inspects the objects and looks at the list of methods and says, hey, did I touch any of these when I shouldn't have? This gives us yet another access for checking that we're doing the thing that we're expecting when we find ourselves in an incompatible environment. Hmm. Okay, so. Not unexpectedly, Bales 3 came out, new version, hot new stuff. That's excellent. So this actually does include a new feature that we care about. So we saw earlier that you know the canonical thing for a Bales command is that it has a run method. Well, Bales 3 introduces an unrun. So if you provide it with basically undo for your command line, it'll support that for you. This is awesome. Undo. Anybody ever make a mistake here? No? That you need to undo? No. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. I find this to be a really exciting new feature. And I would like for you know, Straw to be able to interact with that correctly. So this is what it looks like in, co in code. So we give it our run and our unrun. And then uh, what I want for my test, so I want to run 
my untweet command and see that I wrote out the right instrumentation for that. I took the right data that I was expecting. Okay, so this is the test that I want. I put this in and I go and I run Bales against the 3.0 version and everything is green. It all worked right. The plumbing was there, everything hooked up correctly to do what I wanted it to do. So, that's great, fabulous. What do you think happens when I run this? Any votes? No unrun. No unrun, that's right. So my test is not valid unless you're running on the 3.0 version of Bales. So I've checked it, but it's not gonna work if we're on those older versions. This makes me sad. And there's what the failure looks like. So it does write out some stuff, but you can see the length is different. So 28 versus 25. And there was also uh, the status code, that second thing, it returned a one. So it failed, the command failed when it should have passed. Well, clearly we've got a little bit of work to do. And it's something that we can deal with very similarly to how we dealt with older versions of the stuff. We can check our Bales version. And there's a couple of flavors of how we can do this. So our test unrun, right now it's just one method. So wrapping it in an if like this, it's not too bad. It doesn't introduce too much complexity for things. I've also seen it written like this. So each individual test at the beginning of it, if it is conditional on some sort of environmental factor like the version, um, will return immediately. And so the test will run, but it will never actually execute any of the other code that would potentially have any sort of failure. These are okay for a small number of tests, but if you have large amounts of code that are dependent on a particular version, I actually like to break them out into their own file entirely. You know, There's nothing that Ruby says that makes it so that your test files have to be one-to-one -one with your production code files, right? So I make specific files for things that are particular to new environments. And an important point about this is also that when we do the version check, in the case where we skip running a test file, I have it output some text to let me know that it's doing that. This is because if I've accidentally botched the comparison of how I'm, whether I'm supposed to run this test or not, if that doesn't say anything and just doesn't run some tests, I'm unlikely to notice that it's not running things that I wish it was. Where this makes it really obvious. So if I run on a given version and it's skipping tests that it's not supposed to, I'm gonna see that output and I'm gonna look at it and go, whoa, hey, it should have actually been running that test. So protect yourself if you're going to be skipping tests. Think hard about whether you want those to be skipped silently or not. So every major framework that comes out that really changes the face of how we develop a certain type of technology, you know, it brings out competitors. It brings out people with another way of looking at things. And for Bales, that was no different. Um, after Bales came out, there were, you know, over a couple of versions, there was some accusations of things getting bloated and slow and that it was, you know, not as simple as it could have been. It wasn't, you know, in the spirit of Ruby being so, so nice and terse for us. And so Crooner came out as a response to that. And, you know, I gotta, I gotta admit, that's, that's a lot less typing than the Bales command. You know, you don't have the class, you don't have the extra method definitions. Function's pretty much the same. You know, you can say croon the tweet. I mean, it gives you a fairly equivalent set of stuff. So, this is great for the ecosystem. It's good when there are alternatives and different ways that you can accomplish the same thing. And so from Straw, I wanted to be able to instrument this as well. You know, I wanted to have the numbers. I didn't want to have to care whether a command was Bales or Crooner. I wanted things to just work and all that data to get gathered the same way. So this led me to developing uh, another way of partitioning my tests, which I refer to as test suites. So prior to this, we've been running a particular framework and the majority of the tests that we ran, ran against that framework and most of them applied. There was some variation by frameworks, but like now with Crooner, I wanna be able to run tests that only apply for Crooner and the Bales tests are not gonna apply at all. 
And so the suites kind of mark out the territories of sets of tests that belong with a given framework. So we start off on heading that direction in our rake task for running multiverse. And what you can see here, this is a lot shorter than it was. So we have a method that finds our suites and then goes through each of them. And then it's separately invoking a test runner uh, script file for us and passing us that suite and gem file. So where before we were driving just rake tests, now we've got a little bit of extra machinery here that understands our suites and understands the layout of our gem files that we've got to invoke. That test runner um, is pretty simple. So it looks something like this, sets up some of our load paths, and then goes through and requires the test files that are in that particular suite directory. So now, rather than running all of the tests that we've got, we're going to run a subset of them. And then we're going to run that in the presence of the right gem file. The test runner takes care of that setup for us. So this allows us now to say rake multiverse crooner or rake multiverse bales and run an entire suite of those tests, each of them potentially against multiple versions itself. And we're back to a spot where we can test things independently the way that we would like. But you know, just because you're busy developing new features and working against new frameworks doesn't mean that older stuff can't break or have weird problems come up. So bundle execing your rake multiverse. You know, it, like every time I've done the rake multiverse, I've never put bundle exec on it because I knew that you didn't need it. You don't need it because it loads a gem file itself later on. So it was kind of unnecessary. But it's really weird that this would break it um, like that. Well, so I did a little digging. And this is actually an interesting tidbit that helped me to understand some of how bundler itself actually works. So in our rake file, when we say bundle exec rake uh, multiverse, it's going to run this Ruby code. And because we've said bundle exec, it's going to load the context of the gem file that's there in the root of our directory. So when we run this Ruby command to go run our test runner, in effect, bundler has configured the environment to say, hey, I want you to use this gem file in the root of your project. And it also passes an option that says, Ruby, go load this as soon as this process starts running. And so by the time our test runner gets started, Bundler has already set itself up for the gem file in the root of our project. And because of this little bit of code in Bundler, if it's already been set up, it doesn't do anything else. And so what's happening is when we bundle exec that rate command, we don't end up loading the correct specialized gem file for our tests at that lower level. We end up running with just the gem file from our gem over and over. And some of the tests just don't work properly in that environment. Well, it turns out the bundler team is smart and sharp and knows what they're doing. And they provided us with an out here. So when you say bundler with clean env, Anything that's executed inside of that block gets executed without those extra environmental changes that I showed you. So now, this executes plainly the way that it is. Bundler isn't loaded by my test runner. I can load my special gem file at the later point that I need to. And things are back to working. And well, yeah, OK, this is true. One thing about this sort of testing, you know, as you get more versions, as you get more frameworks that you're dealing with, you know, tests take longer to run. And the more tests that you write, like that's a cost for every one of those to go. And I wish that it was faster too. So this got me thinking about different ways that we could speed up the test suite. You know, the fact that we've got our own test runner already in the mix here kind of helps us out. There's some places where we can break things up. Um, a natural place that you might think to go with this is some sort of forking approach. You know, we could fork off the test processes. Those could run independently and potentially in parallel. Um, but just about the time that I was thinking about doing that, this came in. <laughs> JRuby, yeah, JRuby. Is JRuby funny? I don't know. JRuby's awesome. I don't know. The thing about JRuby is that it doesn't have a fork command. It's built on the JVM. The JVM's not really a Unixy sort of thing. And so 
you know, the whole idea of being able to fork processes is just not going to go anywhere for us. But thankfully, there is another option, and there's another way that we can slice this to get our test to run in parallel for us um, without forks. So what we're going to do is we are going to take our multiverse runner, where we were starting off. We're going to have a list of threads that we're going to run. Inside of our bundler imp, when we go to execute that subcommand that's going to run our tests, we're going to create a new thread. So this is going to step off and run its block in a separate thread inside of the main process that's running rake. Now, all that's going to happen inside of that thread is it's going to turn around and backtick and go run my tests as a separate process. But because starting that process is now off on another thread, this can happen in parallel for all of the tests. All the tests get their own thread, each of them start up a sub-process, and everything runs at the same time. Now, importantly with this, you do need to join at the end of it and wait for each of those threads to come back. So each of those thread blocks is going to wait to return, basically, until that backticked Ruby invocation comes back. So this will let us wait for all of our tests to run. All those processes fan out. They all run at the same time. Once they all come back, then my rake task can get finished. Things are faster. We can run in parallel. Pretty awesome. <sighs> Why don't you fail properly? Yeah, OK. I guess that makes a little bit of sense. So we, we fanned things out to a whole bunch of these different processes. But what happens when one of those fails, right? We weren't doing any sort of checks. We're not looking at what the response was back from that. All we're doing is printing the output. So we need to handle this. We need to deal with our status codes. It's probably a good idea. I do love Unix, so it's important that we maintain that. All right, so this turns out to be pretty simple to deal with. Um, thanks to the convention that Unix has that a status code of 0 means success. So anything non-zero from any of my test processes means that we had a failure. So we're just going to take a, a variable. We're going to start at 0, track our status. And then as each of these processes comes back, we're going to look at the exit status that came back from that child. And we're going to increment it into the status. So this gives us some indication that a test process has failed. And if multiple of them fail, eh, we'll increment the status more than once. It doesn't matter to us particularly. We care that it gets a failure. And we're going to return that status as the status from the rake invocation at the end of the process. So this tells us that something failed if any of them did. And that adds in. All right. There may be some race conditions. There always are with threads. It'd be good to track those down, but it's the core idea. So <laughs> Kwu is being really helpful. Thank you, Kwu. So many issues, so many things to find. So one of the things about this sort of parallelizing your tests and going and running them in subprocesses, in particular the way that we're doing it using a backtick, is that that captures the input and output and basically waits for the test process to run and return back to you before it does anything. And so if you do something like put a binding pry into your process, it's going to stop. It's going to print to the output the little prompt that it's doing. And it's going to sit there and it's going to wait for you to give it input and to continue. And meanwhile, our test driver at the top is going to sit there and wait for the backtick to return before it prints anything for you. So it looks like this hangs. It looks like it just goes off and doesn't hit anything um, that we can run. So, you know, running this and, and dealing with this problem for multiple processes would be kind of hard and kind of messy. But luckily, we can, um, yeah, that's the line where we're doing it. Luckily, we had extracted our test runner. We talked about it a little bit earlier. We, we made the thing that does like one invocation of our test and runs that process separately for us. And we can leverage that to give ourselves kind of a debug mode that we can get into. So we add a task called serial. Maybe should have uh, embedded it under multiverse. But it will run a particular suite and a particular gem file. Now, this is only going to run one. 
This isn't going to run everything for us. It's just for when you're targeting a particular thing. But what it does is you'll notice instead of backticking or instead of running another thread, this is directly invoking our test runner. So now our rake process, our main driving process, is the thing that is now running our tests. And so any of your debugging aids, anything that's going to stop, is going to stop right there in process. And you'll be able to see the output of it and interact with it the way that you need to. All right, so we've got a little bit of debugging tools there. That's good. Time to wrap up. So what have we learned here today? We've learned that Bundler provides us with a lot of sharp tools for being able to manage different sets of our gems. You know, it's not just for tacking bundle exec on the front of every command you ever put in your shell. You know, it brings some other things to the table. We've learned a little bit about Rake. Just touched on briefly, but there's a lot of cool things that it provides for doing, you know, kind of helpful automation scripts for building out these sorts of systems. We took a look at a lot of different things about managing when you're dependent on different versions. You know, if you're writing an application and you get to control the gems that you have to use and what versions they're on, this may not be a big concern for you. But if you ever write a library that has some sort of dependency out on the, the external world, you lose some of that ability to say, you must use this. Um, it's, it can be difficult to give people the support that you want. And having a good test suite that's able to test in the sorts of environments that you're going to encounter is really valuable. And lastly, we looked at a few tactics for parallelizing things. Um, it's a good thing to do with your tests. It's good to keep things so that they're not running really long. Hopefully, oh, and we looked at suites, different ways of breaking things apart. Hopefully, this has helped you get some ideas about testing. And your testing will be more like this and less like this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Were there time for questions or any questions? I missed most of that. Can you start again? I could, but it's also online. It was given at Ruby on Ales, and the video is available. Yes. Versions of Ruby. When we have done this, uh, we've managed that externally, um, just through like a Jenkins parallel build. So yeah, that's, there's only so many axes you can pivot things on before it gets too painful. So any other questions? All right, thank you.